Hey guys, how's everybody doing? So um, for those of you who don't know, I'm Mike Bizarre, and I'm, I'll make a little confession. I'm what's known as a conference rat. Um, every spring, every fall, I go to IT conferences every week for the last 30 years. And so I would just like to let you know, though, that you know, as I sat here for the last two days, that the divide between business and IT has never been wider. We've been talking about it for 20 years now, and I'm going to argue that this panel is going to be one of the more important panels you're ever going to hear on this subject. And so with that, though, I don't think most people know exactly what we mean by low code. So I'm going to open up with Johan kind of giving us a little tutorial about what low code is, because it's not what you think it is. It's not assembler, and it's not about a place where my friends are. It's about a different way of thinking. Thanks, Mike. So low code, I think, is best explained by um, taking one step back. So why are we all here? That's because we want to win in a software-driven world. And that's why we are interested or in Cloud Foundry or using Cloud Foundry. And if you think about Cloud Foundry and the advantages of Cloud Foundry, um, basically two key words uh, pop into my mind. Cloud Foundry is all about abstraction and automation. It's about abstracting away from lower level infrastructure layers and making sure we move from an infrastructure oriented world to an app centric world. So what Cloud Foundry is doing is applying abstraction and automation to application deployment and operations. And basically, low code is doing the exact same thing, abstraction and automation, but then to application development and evolution. So low code is all about abstracting away from lower level programming and making sure you can use visual models to build your applications. And that means that you can use, um, it, it's faster, so it's up to 10 times faster than traditional programming, but it's also inviting broader audience to developing applications and being part of the application development process. Cool. So with that, you know, I was talking about the divide between business and IT, and I, you know, I just kind of want to put a thought in your head for a minute. Business people care about one thing, it's called the number. And the number is the X number of things that have to be sold by Y amount of time at Z profit. And it's all they're ever thinking about. They get up in the morning and they think about that number. They go to bed at night, they think about that number. They kiss their spouses and they think about that number. And it's, it's on their mind all the time. So when you guys show up and go, you know, we're going to cut the amount of time that it takes to develop an app from two years to 12, you know, they forgot what you said, I mean, two years to 12 months, they forgot what you said even before you left the room because it has nothing to do with the number in their head. And so they're thinking about the world differently than you think about it. So with that in mind, I want each panelist to kind of introduce themselves and kind of talk about how you came to Mendex and how it kind of changed the culture in your organization. Let's sure. start with Olu. Uh, so I'm Olu Brown. I work as a director at MIT. Um, I run an application platforms team so we've been using Mendix, I would say, for around two and a half years. Um, John Charles, the CIO for MIT, came in and wanted to have kind of a more data-driven approach to application development. Um, and Mendix was identified as a platform that we could actually use um, to prototype applications and to kind of manage kind of that low-code infrastructure framework and application layer to really figure out, does it work? Um, you know, I think, short answer, it has worked. We have about 15 applications that we're running at MIT, but it's changed kind of the paradigm on how we develop these applications. Because like you said, Michael, um, things can take a year to two years to develop something. We generally turn stuff around in three to four months now. Cool. Jonathan? I'm Jonathan Boucher, I'm a partner with the Solomon Group uh, we're in New Orleans, Louisiana. We produce uh, very large events sporting events and entertainment events. And uh, the way we came to Mendix is we were, uh, we have some pretty unique processes in our industry that we have to go through. And uh, we were looking for a piece of software to help us manage uh, large scale events. And uh, we quickly found that there was nothing out there that fit our process. And we didn't want to buy an off-the-shelf piece of software that made us conform to the process that the software was written for. Uh, so we decided we had to create our own. 
And by creating our own we meant, let's go find a software company. So we went down that road for about a year and we realized that the expense and the complication of just explaining our process to someone else who wasn't in our business was going to take way too long, cumbersome, and expensive. So we started looking around and said, okay, maybe this is a FileMaker thing. What is this? What can we use? And we came across Mendix. And um, we started by building out the ERP program I'm speaking about, it, which we use in, in house and it's been live for about a year and a half now. And it uh, basically, uh, the processes we wanted to use in our business, we developed a system for in Mendix and not the other way around of trying to buy a piece of software and make our process fit that. So that was hugely important to us and it's been a, a great return on our investment with Mendix. Since then, we've even gone further and realized that we use Mendix for our clients. So we have about 20 applications running right now. Three of them are internal and the rest are for our clients. Uh, large event, uh, events that you've probably been to. Cool, Beth Ann. Hey, great. Uh, my name is Beth Ann Bergsmark. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Academic Systems and Chief Enterprise Architect at Georgetown University. And you know, I spend the majority of my time really focusing on how can we across the entire campus break down aging legacy IT that's locked in silos, moving into modern platforms in a way that embraces innovation rather than impedes innovation. And if you've ever had any connection with academia, you don't always think of academia as you know, cutting edge. We're a little bit more the glacier. But I think that that's changing now with options like Mendix and low code and cloud. Uh, we adopted Mendix in a specific uh, our research and regulatory domain. You know, we had very traditional IT problem. Uh, we had five or six uh, different applications. One was failing at scale. Four didn't really meet the needs of individual campuses because in higher ed, not only do we have very specific processes that are unique, each campus will define that process independently. So it's almost an exponential increase in the number of legacy applications that can exist at any one point in time. And traditionally, our solution path would be look for a software package, which is not going to meet half the needs, and then that will spur more shadow IT. Or I could hire a consultant that would build me a very expensive custom application that I would never be able to change, so it would be out of date within 12 hours of launch. Uh, we could build it ourselves, but that would take two years, and at that point, half the developers would have gone graduated and gone someplace else, and no one would know their code. So Mendix really offered us several options. One, speed to launch and to accelerate, uh, follow the cloud first principle, but most importantly is what we found in the, the low code environment was the ability for reuse and repeatability. And we use this as an opportunity not to replace five disparate apps, but to build one app so we could combine where the campuses had already agreed on similar business processes, but then build in the variation for other areas. And the benefit that that brought to our business was not only solving the problem, driving down some of the costs, speed to launch, but we improved the experience for our researchers, who in the past, you might be one researcher, but you've got to go to all of these different places. I mean, at one point, we even had seven websites to tell you which way to go, and the instructions were not the same every time. So giving them one simple, intuitive experience that we can also innovate and change over time has been phenomenal. And we really see this as an excellent tool for dealing with, all, you know, I think we've got like 800 of these apps out there. So down the road. So have you guys kind of changed the, I don't like the word, but paradigm in terms of what a developer is? And I ask the question because everybody's thinking about, you know, there's a developer shortage and I can't do this and I can't do that. And then we wind up prioritizing stuff. So, you know, in your shops, have you seen more developers or people who aren't really traditional developers, they might even be business people or whatever, sure. actually starting to write applications, I don't, maybe not code per se, but they're building apps. I mean, are you guys seeing that? And Yeah, I mean, I think at MIT, um, our Menix development team, none of them were traditional software developers. Um, we had QA engineers, a technical project manager, um, and a senior business analyst who took up Mendix. I think the biggest part that Mendix brings is if you have an analytical and logical kind of structure, you can build the applications without having to dig down in, you know, into the kind of low uh, application programming area. Cool. Yeah, I think we found a similar thing in our business. Mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, we, uh, the nature of our business with producing large events, is, there's a lot of technical aspects to that, sound lighting, video, and all those types of things. So we were able to take some of those folks who were te technically savvy and understood structure, electronics, and some of those things that could kind of cross over into the code world and uh, 
quickly and let them come loose on Mendix, and they were able to quickly, none of these people had ever made an app before mm -hmm. uh, they touched the Mendix application, so they were able to quickly kind of figure it out. Now we're a year plus into it, and I would say they could probably teach a class on Mendix at this point. Right. We've seen similar crossovers. So when we first started using Mendix, um, we definitely you know, built the team with some traditional Java programmers. But then you know, some of our best Mendix developers have been from our DBA team and joining in into this agile team environment. Uh, I think that where the role for developer is changing, and this, this is true of every area in the IT stack. So the last 10 years, we forced our IT professionals into these very tight, we defined area. So I'm the VM person, I'm the block storage person, I'm the developer of this language, I'm the architect in this area. And the new technologies really require you to not only think across the IT stack, but to understand the business and the user experience. So I think where our developers are starting to shift their mindset is not just thinking that I'm going to code to spec, but I'm actually going to think about what the overall customer experience is. And I'm, I'll use speed as a good example. Like speed is the unspoken requirement that will tank your application that no stakeholder will ever tell you is important. But as developers are starting to realize that, and I think that that's helping to traverse this gap of understanding the dynamic infrastructure, in terms of understanding what gets adopted and what doesn't. Yeah, and for us it was uh, having someone involved. Uh, it, was, it seemed like it was far easier for us to find someone who knew what the process should be and uh, let them figure out how to do the programming than the other way around. Mm -hmm. and the, the beauty, of course, is that if you have, I mean, we, we, you started this panel by say, uh, talking about the gap between business and IT. Yeah. And the best way to solve that is to make sure that the same people are all involved in application development, not only in giving feedback, but also in uh, designing part of the application, the business processes, the UI uh, of that application. So basically, if you lower the barrier of how you build applications, uh, you could say that, that that is democratizing application development because more people are able to build applications and be part of that whole process. Yeah, I think participation is actually really the key, right? Mm -hmm. um, every one of the uh, projects that we work on, we make sure the business and the development team are together, involved, working through that whole process. Um, it's no longer, you gave us a spec, we'll go away for eight years and come mm -hmm. back and deliver something. And then you're gonna tell me it's wrong. <laughs> I don't even remember asking you to develop it in the first place. <laughs> but, um, yeah, in the land of DevOps, there's this notion in the Agile thing about two in a box, but the two is always two developers kind of working hand in glove, but in, in reality, the two in the box should be one developer and one business person who are kind of building something together. I always like to visualize that. I mean, we talk a lot about DevOps uh, at this conference. So you have the operations, developers, and we should merge these two worlds and make a cross-functional team. I think we should do the same thing if you look at application development and the business and kind of merge these two worlds as well. So have a cross-functional team that includes uh, people from the business or the domain experts that can immediately express their needs into visual models. Right. Business people, by the way, don't distinguish between developers and IT. They pretty much hate you both and they don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you, we're at a Cloud Foundry thing, so can you take a minute and describe, you know, what is the connection between Mendix and Cloud Foundry and why do you care and why are you here? Basically, <coughs> we care about Cloud Foundry a lot, <laughs> but in two <laughs> different ways. So uh, first, if you look at uh, Mendix as a platform, it's not just about application development. It's about supporting the entire application lifecycle, so from uh, your first idea to building the application, to deploying it, to gathering feedback, and then so the whole cycle is supported in our platform. So for the deployment part, our, we have our own public cloud, uh, and that's based on Cloud Foundry, so open source Cloud Foundry running on Amazon. Um, so if you build an application, basically model your application, you can just one click upload that to our cloud, and then it will run on Cloud Foundry. Uh, and of course, that's so something that, that uh, speeding up the whole uh, process of our internal engineering. So instead of building that whole layer ourselves, we, uh, we pick it back on top of Cloud Foundry. So that's one reason. Um, the other way, the reason why we are uh, really happy with Cloud Foundry, that it's a, a standardization of our deployment target. So we want to offer our customers uh, flexibility and freedom in where they want to run their application. So we really have a multi-cloud uh, strategy. 
Um, and with Cloud Foundry, we can run everywhere. So we run on our own public cloud, so we can run on any uh, Cloud Foundry vendor uh, that's at this conference. And we can, uh, so you can run your application on premise, on a Cloud Foundry uh, distribution, uh, or on any public uh, environment that's based on Cloud Foundry. And for us, that's of course um, a very easy thing to do because uh, it's all the same API and it's the same uh, layer. So that, that's, a, that's a great thing. Cool. So you, can you guys describe, I mean, have you had any interaction with the Cloud Foundry part or is it invisible to you? There's a runtime somewhere. Yeah. So I, I mean, <laughs> generally it's invisible. Um, at least to, to us, uh, we use the Mendix Cloud to deploy our applications. Um, and, you know, I think it's taken a lot of the burden off of us from just from a support and operations perspective, right? Um, we can log in through the managed platform to kind of see all of the different metrics associated with our applications running in the cloud, view the logs, do, do all the kind of normal support and operational stuff without having to kind of go down a level layer. A level lower. Um, I didn't know what Cloud Foundry was until they invited me to this conference. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and we have 20 applications running uh, in the right now live production. So, yeah, it's uh, pretty invisible to us. And, uh, it yeah, I, I would say also, I mean, I think it's a little bit like, you know, when you're buying a pan, I want a non-stick pan. I'm not really checking to see if it's Teflon, but it's the Teflon that makes the pan non-stick. And I think that many of the business procurement environments aren't going to look that deep. I mean, even today, I have proposals across my desk where, oh, this is cloud, and I look at this, and I was like, well, this is, this is traditional shrink rack proprietary software on a physical server in somebody's garage. This right. is not really cloud. <laughs> I know we don't have to buy a server, but it, there's, there are some differences here. So I think that translation, what Cloud Foundry gives Mendex, and what I expect as a consumer of Mendex, is the ability to dynamically scale. Because I have a lot of applications that have the cyclical peak. Um, I'm looking for portability. I'm looking for continuous integration that provides no downtime to me. And in, I'm fine with multi-tenant environments, but because I'm in higher ed and I know our cycles are all the same, I want to know that that scale is partitioned and I want to know that another customer that does something bad cannot hit my data stream. So I think it gives Mendex and other companies capabilities that the business is looking for, but they're not defining it in terms of I'm looking for Cloud Foundry per se. Right. A lot of times the business doesn't even know what the order of the possible is. Right. So they're kind of, so, and I, since we're talking about that, I'll bring this up. So the buzzword of the day is digital business transformation, which mm -hmm. means nothing. I mean, it's a lovely term, but it means absolutely nothing. But at the end of the day, are you seeing a change in the way that business people think about IT or engage with IT as a result of what you guys are doing? And, and can you describe a little bit about, you know, what you're seeing on that side of the house in terms of, you know, how they interact with you or, in, or even think about things? Sure. I mean, you know, I think you definitely see a change. I think traditionally, you know, they come to IT with an idea and, you know, kind of a specific set of things to do, and we deliver it exactly to that spec, which is maybe not exactly what they need. Um, you know, the level of interaction that we have now in kind of using these low-code environments allows everyone to participate in the entire process, and we actually, you know, are much more in touch with our clients uh, around the university, right? Uh, we talk to them, you know, four or five times a week, even though we have maybe one scheduled business meeting during the week. Um, so I think, you know, that iteration has been very helpful and allow us to kind of switch gears depending on what they figure out as they use the system, right? Because it's that whole cycle of actually using the system, providing feedback, and we make additional changes that has helped, uh, which is not, you know, a more, the traditional design process for IT, especially in universities. Yeah, absolutely. And I think in our, in our business, we, you know, going back before the Mendix era, uh, where we were like, uh, how are we making this system work for us for this? And I'm like, well, we just name where it says client, we just put the project ID, and then we just put this over here in this field, and then we put a little star in the corner, and, then, and we're like, no. Um, so now we're able to, and I think it's a double-edged sword with Mendix, uh, considering how quickly we can iterate the application, sometimes on our, uh, some of our apps multiple times a week. Uh, releasing a new version, but um, people people start to see, oh wait, we can actually make it do what we need it to do, and then it becomes a barrage. Of, do this, do that, do that. We need this. What about it? This, 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 and then it's like, oh, so calm down now. 
we got to actually test this stuff and, and make sure it's reliable and that there's no, you know, nothing in the buggy that's going to take the whole thing down. But um, that's been our experience. I think it's, it's a double-edged sword. Yeah. Well, I've seen a huge change in this whole transformation in the technology industry is a chance for a do-over with your relationships and the dialogue that you're having with your business stakeholders. I still think that there's a long way to go. Um, you know, I think we see it most in mobile, that in business environments, especially in very distributed environments, it's very difficult for people to change what they've done for 20 years. And so you may be able to build something, a business process in a mobile, but it doesn't feel like a mobile experience. And especially in a higher ed where we have students and they're willing to say, why? why? Why does it look this way? Why would I have to do it this way? Um, being successful really requires completely rethinking how you break down some of those traditional barriers. I mean, the different business units across the areas, how many steps, how can you simplify, how can you streamline, and that also often requires governance decisions, <coughs> changes, changes in funding allocations, working with your CFO's office to go from CapEx models to OpEx models. So that transformation and change with the business isn't really just about what we're building. It's, it's much more fundamental in terms of how your organization is leveraging technology to meet their needs and the willingness to go through that change process. It's always funny to see if, if people start to, to feel that application development can be right. faster, you see a change in the whole organizational right. behavior. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's, so basically what, what we see a lot is that um, if you build your first application and you do it in 30 days instead of a year, then people start to ask what Jonathan was saying, like, okay, can you do this and this and this? And then it becomes uh, uh, and the next challenge, basically. But the beauty is that people uh, change their uh, level of expectation. So, and uh, I think that has two um, uh, effect, effects. So one is that uh, they start coming with new ideas again, because in a lot of organizations, uh, people don't share their ideas anymore. Because if you share your idea and people say, oh, great idea, and then two years later nothing happened, you stop doing that. You stop sharing your ideas because it doesn't help in any way. Mm -hmm. If you know that um, your IT organization or, uh, so, uh, can build applications a lot faster now, then you start coming up with new ideas again. So the whole kind of experimentation and innovation uh, within the company is changing a lot. So that, that's an important uh, aspect. What's also important, I think, uh, that is uh, the, the change that if people understand and believe that you can quickly build an application, but not only the first version, but you can keep on changing it, you, that, that will lead to smaller applications. We, and we all want that, right? So if you big monoliths, uh, difficult to maintain, yes. difficult to change, um, but people will request basically a big application because they know if they are now on top of the list to be, to be uh, served by IT developing the application, your next, uh, the next time you will be on top of the list is two years from now. So you better ask everything you want to have and have that in that single application. Mm -hmm. So you need to change that behavior as well so that you can focus on smaller applications, iterating quickly and things like that. So, and I think that's also an important aspect of mm -hmm. changing that whole behavior uh, and uh, how you work together in the organization. So business people play a lot of golf and so the one term they understand is mulligan. So <laughs> Mendix is a giant IT mulligan. <laughs> when you think about um, the term, you used uh, smaller things, and one of the buzzwords of the day is microservices. Mm -hmm. Nobody's really quite sure what the hell a microservices is, is, so I'm just going to say it's something that's smaller than what was there before. So are we going to like get to the point, though, where the thinking of microservices and Agile is built into the product itself, and it's not something I need to think about it? Because if I need to think about it, it's probably not going to work. So, you know, are, are we kind of getting to the point where the concepts are baked into the tools? I think in any case, you always need to uh, think for yourself and uh, decide uh, if you build an application or build a service, uh, so what the granularity is. Um, and that doesn't differ for Mendix or Java or whatever uh, language you use to build applications. So. Uh, but that's the beauty of Cloud Foundry as well. It's a polyglot uh, environment. So you can build your uh, microservice or small applications using Mendix. You can extend that uh, using code. 
by the way. So it's not just only, only visual modeling. You can extend with Java or JavaScript, so you're never stuck into the environment. But you can also, in your whole landscape, deploy uh, 10, 20 Mendix applications, but also uh, your Java microservices to uh, extend the capabilities of what you're doing. So it's uh, basically your choice to uh, how you organize that, uh, that whole landscape. So with that in mind, can you guys maybe describe how it is that the usage of Mendix or the applications you're building, are, are they more externally facing? Are you seeing more integration externally with other entities? And you know, is that kind of changing the way you think about your, your, your role? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it, it definitely integration is one of the top, you know, priorities associated with a lot of the applications that we use. Um, you know, in an educational environment, we have student system, we have our ERP, and then we have lots of departmental applications uh, around the institute that we expose in whatever way we can, and how do we pull that Pull, pull that information into an application. Traditionally, it's always kind of extracting data and pumping it into another database, um, which has its own issues. But uh, you know, I think with a platform like Mendix, we're able to create these kind of microservices that can interact with the data from these different systems. We can leverage uh, existing APIs that we have uh, in systems around campus and pull all of that information into Mendix. So we actually have uh, applications that our students use that um, you know connect to the traditional student system to pull data so that they can change their major or you know um, drop classes things like that uh, and then we also interact internally with departmental applications for like patent invention submission things like that um, but Mendix acts as kind of the UI layer and a portion of the integration layer. We have an instance uh, client that's a very large music uh, festival production company, and they um, wanted a single source of truth for scheduling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so our Mendix application that we developed for them is the single source of truth for what artist is going on what stage and when for all of their music festivals. That then pushes out to their different WordPress sites for the public facing schedule. And it's basically the, the talent buyer enters that information and it flows through to all of the other locations. So it's a single source of truth for that because it's hugely important to their, to their business and to their consumers. It's just one example. Really using Mendix, in, in, also in our internal application, a single source of truth for job codes and you know how much is labor costing and all these types of different things. Right. Yeah, I'll, I'll build on that. I mean, I think the big win for us is to is really moving away from these applications where shadow data that would never map or align to the data in the core ERPs right. was being collected in 50 different areas or really being seen as being lost in cracks. Yeah. So you lose all that downstream ability for personalization, data analysis, actual data. Uh, so Mendix has been important in terms of being able to support the variation in the app needs, but using our tool like MuleSoft to come back and connect to the data. I also really think that you know down the road where there's amazing opportunity is that if we can care less about what the app is, because centrally we care about the data, and if we look at what's going on in the mobile environment where apps are disposable, you know, they work for a function, they're a micro function, they mash up data across the way. When things change, somebody grabs a new app and they're mixing and matching. So, so if our organizations could deliver secure data and these thin, lightweight development platforms, we can move to that area where we've got disposable apps. Johan, can you kind of give us a little history of where we are? And I'm going to ask this question because I admire developers as much as anybody, but the truth of the matter is they're kind of snobs. Right. And basically they're like, you know, I got my programming language and my skills and this is the best thing ever and, you know, this is all there is in the world. But so back in the day, you know, we had everything from 4GLs to modeling tools and, you know, we're kind of down a similar concept and path. But, you know, connect the dots a little bit about how Mendix came from that thought process and how you kind of got to where you are now. Uh, so basically, if you look at the history of programming, we always have been... Um, focused on, I'll use the words again, abstraction and automation. Mm -hmm. Because we always wanted to go to a higher abstraction level, make sure we could be more productive uh, from assembler to uh, second and third generation languages. Um, and of course, the whole idea of low code or whatever you call it, is not new. 
we have been trying to uh, speed up development uh, for a long time. And so you look, look at case tools, 4GL tools, um, and maybe you have bad memories with that. Uh, that could de definitely be the case. Um, and I think why a lot of these tools uh, have failed in the past, like the 4GL tools, uh, a main reason there is that they uh, basically missed a paradigm shift in the market. So they were focused on building, uh, for example, desktop applications uh, very quickly, but then the web came or mobile came. Um, so the, from basically at Mendix, from the beginning, we have been really, really uh, focused on uh, making sure that we are not speeding up how you build yesterday's applications faster, but always focused on uh, how to build tomorrow's applications faster. So making sure that people can actually innovate, because that's the part of the organization that has a need for speed. The part of the organization that wants to innovate, introduce new services, new business models, you want to quickly experiment, because innovation is all about experimentation. So you need to try out 10 new app IDs in one month, and then throw nine away, and maybe that, that, that last one is the one that will really change your business. So you need to kind of fill fast and keep iterating. Um, and if you look at applications in general, so if you want to build tomorrow's application, I think the next paradigm shift in applications is what I would call smart applications. And if you look at a smart app, that's, for me that has two, uh, three main characteristics. So a smart application is uh, context aware, so it knows where the user is, what the user is doing, uh, the context of the business process, maybe uh, sensors around uh, the user uh, with the Internet of Things. Uh, so that's one characteristic. The second one is that a smart app is intelligent. So it knows how to process all that data and make decisions uh, using algorithms or machine learning. Um, and if you combine these two things, being context aware, and uh, being intelligent, you, can, you come to the third characteristic of a smart app, which is uh, proactive. So making sure that instead of the user going to the app to trigger an action or to get information, that the app comes to the user using interactive push notifications or whatever technologies uh, we can use. And then, uh, so I think we, we have to focus as application developers, as the platform builders, on making sure that we enable the next generation of applications uh, so that we actually help um, uh, our customers to innovate quickly and to really uh, enable them. Uh, so it's not just about how you build applications or how you deploy them or how you operate them, but also the type of applications that you build. Mm -hmm. um, failing fast is also one of those cute little Silicon Valley terms mm -hmm. that business people don't get either. They're like, <laughs> not something they really want to do. Like, like, they like phrases like winning sooner. Try that. Um, can you guys describe what do you know now about implementing Mendix or moving to this model that you wish you knew before you started? Yeah, I mean, so one of the things I, you know, I think we mentioned before around once you have that paradigm shift, shift and the users realize that their ideas can actually be implemented in a short turnaround time, um, managing kind of that flow, right? Because I think what a lot of, what, kind of the trap that you can get into is that there's a lot of churn as well, right? That you're kind of starting and stopping and, and re-implementing re the same idea maybe like two or three times during the mm -hmm. course of the project, which sometimes it's okay, you know, but I, I do think there's components of traditional software development that still apply in how you think about architecting an application. Uh, and so how does that tr translate into kind of a low code environment like Mendix? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and again, I think you get to it. I wish we had gotten to it faster. <laughs> it probably took us maybe six months too long um, to, to kind of figure that out. But now that we have, you know, I think we're producing, you know, more efficiently and at a faster rate. And I'll, I'll, I'll answer that question a little bit differently. And, and I do agree with what you said, but I, you know, from our standpoint, using non-coders to, that are actually the developers now, um, I just wish that they had the experience the last year and a half to go back and work on the first application, which is our <laughs> internal ERP, which is the worst one. Um, it's great, uh, but uh, the user interface and uh, some of the way the, the micro flows are written in the background, now that we've done 15, 20 since then, I want to go back and say, okay, let's redo this now that we've learned all this, uh, all this information and learned all these mm -hmm. skills inside of the appendix. Uh, 
So that's a little bit of a different answer, but that's what I would say, at least for us, because we're using nine developers. Um, yeah, I, I would echo that too. I mean, and one of the things, one, in any environment, when you introduce a tool where it can be faster and easier, the first natural reaction that everybody has is put as much in as you possibly can. I used to teach photography, same thing, digital. I mean, they had enough things in there where this would never load <laughs> over time, you know, so low learning restraint. And we saw the same process where, oh, this is great, we can, you know, add all of these things in. But then as the business users then went through the process, they're like, oh, I'm scrolling through 18 screens. Let's simplify, let's come back. And I, th I think that I wouldn't want to eradicate that. I think the group learning process in and of itself was valuable, but to factor that time and just especially when a particular team comes together for the first time. So I said earlier, I go to conferences all the time and I talk to people at the shows, and basically, you know, everybody's there for the same reason, right? They want to steal a good idea from somebody. So what's the best thing that you guys have built in Mendix that, you know, you think is the coolest thing you've seen so far? And then what's on, you know, your agenda over the horizon? Sure. Um, I don't know. I'd, I'd say we have probably two separate applications currently that I, I would think is a good idea. Um, we have a nanotechnology laboratory uh, on MIT's campus, and so a lot of like the tool scheduling and tool management around laboratory equipment is uh, something that's very time consuming and, and you know just takes up a lot of cycles. So we have an application that helps us with that, not only to schedule the tools, but to actually start up jobs. So we're using Mendix in conjunction with like Bluetooth and other technologies to actually interact with hardware equipment uh, within the laboratory. Um, and that's been a huge boon to, um, you know, the nanotechnology laboratory because they have, you know, hundreds of research projects that are using equipment uh, on a weekly basis and, you know, kind of the, that interaction needs to be automated as much as possible. Um, so that's kind of one, one thing that I think is pretty neat allowing us to interact with hardware equipment. The other is MIT is a research university, so they submit thousands of patent applications uh, you know, every year. And it was all paper, all paper. <laughs> um, so automating that, digitizing all of that information and kind of streamlining that whole process, uh, you know, I think they've been able to process you know, uh, patent applications and, you know, half the time that they used to before, and they're constantly kind of just building upon that. So our legal uh, group at MIT is very grateful for kind of this iterative uh, cycle for application development. Um, and we've been working with them for a year and a half, just constantly either adding new components or adding new applications to that entire environment. So you killed all their scut work in their hands. Yes, no more, no more paper, and lawyers like paper, so. <laughs> yeah, we've been doing a lot with Mendix in the area of uh, events, interactive interaction with uh, attendees and events and music festivals. And, um, trying to blend the production of the event with the user's experience where we're doing the RFID response and we'll have RFID readers out in the, in the field and in the, in the venue and, you know, we uh, let the user link their social accounts to their wristband and uh, link their credit card for spending money at the various um, concessions and whatnot. Uh, and the other, th that's, that's all great from the, money, from the money standpoint, but from the experience, you know, when someone walks into the room, we'll have social media visualization between artists on a huge stage and large screens. We'll actually read the wristbands that are in that area and just use their social content on the screens. Uh, obviously stuff that they've given us approval to. To, uh, to use, but um, really, uh, you know, we did a sporting event where there was, you know, you go to the convention center and you can play the punt, pass, kick thing and get a prize or something. Well, when they walk up to that and they scan their wristband, they look up what their favorite team was and some other information about their favorite number and on the screen in front of them while they're playing the game, their name on the back of the jersey, their favorite team. So it really kind of augmented the live event experience. So full disclosure, though, you were working on something on your way here, right? So yeah. the upside of this thing, or the downside, depending on your point of view, is that you can work on it anytime, anywhere. Yeah, actually, I was on the, on the plane here uh, from New Orleans, and uh, a client needed an extra 
feel the tribute on a, a form. And uh, I was on the plane. And I was like, all right, bored for five hours. So we <laughs> go ahead and knock this out. And actually, the the internet connection on the plane allowed me to commit it and restart the app. And it was live. And before I even got off the plane, let the client know they were thrilled as usual that we were able to so quickly meet their needs. Right. Isn't internet on the plane great? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you usually don't use regulatory compliance and cool in the same sentence. Um, however, I will say that using Mendex in that area that is so close to our core mission in furthering science and uh, for our economic needs, I mean, grant is one of the revenue streams um, into our organization. It's been extremely successful. But I'll answer the question a little bit differently in terms of where I think there's additional need and potential for products like Mendix, and especially if low code can get even further down to no code environments down the road. Um, at Georgetown, we participate in a number of research activities and partnerships with our vendors like Verizon and municipalities, public sector, DC government, looking at smart cities. So how can transport, mobility, wireless, uh, internet of things, sensors and data come together to improve safety, sustainability, and your life? Uh, in general through public, public, private, and higher ed partnerships. What's interesting to me is that when you're, if any of you have ever engaged or built applications for smart cities environment, something like over 90% of those implementations are in the coastal cities only. And when we talk about the digital divide, which we've been talking about for 30 years, we're seeing that accelerate with the pace of change. And what's happening in the middle of the country you're having large areas that are not being exposed to this level of innovation and automation because you don't have the IT areas in those, in those areas. It's all moving to the coast and the urban environments. But a product like Mendex or Cloud Foundry that can broaden that accessibility or the democratization that you talked about, there are enormous applications in, in those areas. So I think that that's really something in terms of looking at not only the sectors that are jumping on quickly, but what are the untapped markets that are out there as well. So we have one to-do list item for Johan so far. So why don't you guys add, you know, what do you want Mendix to do next for you? <laughs> well, so, you know, I think he, he already <laughs> talked about kind of smart applications, right? So, you know, the ability to use, you know, smart services within applications to kind of, again, I think the biggest thing is, is being proactive with, with users of applications, right? More advanced notification of activities that people need to perform is, is a huge boon. I think the other is around data accessibility, right? So we talked about data integration between applications, but one of the things that, that I'm always you know, keen on is data accessibility. So there's data that a, a Mendix application can generate, so how do, non-Mendix kind of uh, consumers use that information as well. And, and that's always uh, a big boon. So I want the integration by, to be more bi-directional. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, we do a lot of um, uh, interesting things. We talked about RFID wristbands earlier and RFID in general. We've done a lot with that, both on the consumer-facing side and in our warehouse, so we keep all of our equipment. Um, lighting, sound, video equipment for, for our live events. Um, but uh, we were able to actually write a widget to inside of Mendix to be able to read the RFID with an Android, regular Android device. And a lot of our competitors and even competing software products that we may have bought prior uh, for inventory tracking, they wanted you to buy this $1,500 RFID reader handheld thing. And we're like, okay, well, the Mendix plugin that we created runs on most mm -hmm. Android devices that have an NFC reader built in, so that's $99 for a prepaid device. So they become disposable at that point. Um, so that's been huge for us. So nothing comes to mind other than that, but we were able to make it work even though it wasn't built in functionality just yet. But in more of those kind of things, like you said, yeah. uh, with the sensors and uh, access to physical data. Well, that's the beauty, of course, of not closing the entire environment, but making it open that you can always extend using JavaScript or Java. So you basically, you're never stuck and you can keep on building uh, additional things, although it's not out of the box in the platform. Yeah, we've, yeah. we've ever had an instance where someone asks for something and we say, well, Mendix can't do that. Yeah. So I just want to check, um, do you have a date for the deliverables on any of this? <laughs> Tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You want me to commit that? <laughs> it's low code, you should be able to deliver it. All right, I want to thank our panelists for sharing their knowledge and their insights, guys. You guys were great. Thank you all for listening. Have a great show. Thank you. Thank you.